Hi, and welcome to episode number 94 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I am Francesc Campoy, and I'm here with my colleague, Mark Madel. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? I am very well today. How are you doing? Pretty good. Very, very excited. I'm going to Australia tomorrow. Ooh, fun. I'm going to Vegas tomorrow. Yeah, I've, yeah. <laughs> I think you win. I think, uh, yeah, I think I you think win. So. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah, there's no koalas in Vegas. Maybe there are. I don't um, know. You know what? There's probably there are probably koalas. koalas in Vegas. <laughs> there are probably koalas in Vegas. Anyway, uh, also very excited because we have two people that were in the BigQuery team before. True. Uh, they are coming to tell us a little bit about uh, BigQuery, but about how it's built under the hood. Yeah. So that's, yeah that's I just assumed it was like magic and unicorns and some other things like that. But apparently there's like real technology that there's, powers yeah. like cool stuff. There's unicorns, uh, there's magic, and also uh, I think it's called Jupiter, but that's the network and then some storage or something. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a weird mix. Uh, so they're going to tell us all about it. And then at the end, we'll have a question of the week, which is about Jarvis. Yeah, so basically, <laughs> I want to be able to talk to my phone like Jarvis from Iron Man, but I need to build a bot to do that. Yep. How can I do that? Uh, yeah, uh, I will try to answer that question as well I am able to, which is <laughs> going to be interesting. But before all of that, we have our cool things of the week. Excellent. Uh, so I think to this week, we are going to look primarily at community stuff, which is quite cool. I want to bring to light uh, a little series written by a person on our team, uh, Lexi. He has, for the last few weeks, been writing a This Week in Google Cloud blog post. So if you're looking for possibly another avenue to get sort of some weekly news about what's happening in GCP, he's got a really nice little wrap-up uh, medium blog post that goes out once a week. Everything from different network performances, PowerShell command lines and BigQuery, benchmarks of Google Perception APIs, Kubernetes and Istio, all sorts of other fun stuff. So it's well yeah. worth like subscribing and having a good checkout. It's really basically like all the cool things of the week, but way more than that, and all in written form. So if you don't want to hear our voices, it's a very good option. Yeah, and speaking of Medium as well, I will put a shout out to uh, another person who wrote an interesting article that I quite like because you know how much I like Deployment Manager. Hey, yay. Uh, all I have is a first name here. It just says Grace. Uh, thank you so much for posting this, Grace. Uh, it's talking about type providers in Deployment Manager. So as you may know, in Deployment Manager, you can deploy, say, like a GCE instance or a Kubernetes cluster. Maybe you want to be able to automate, say, a very particular type of GCE instance. Maybe it has certain permissions or certain startup scripts or other things like that. You can actually define your own types uh, so that you can then reuse those across your Deployment Manager scripts. Uh, so here, Grace is showing us how to do that in a nice step-by-step -step blog post. Cool. And to finish, we have one more cool thing of the week, which actually comes from the team. Aja Hammerly, uh, known as a Thugmizer on the internet, uh, has written a series of blog posts where she built a game that <laughs> apparently I knew, but I didn't know the name of it. Uh, it's called Battleship for those that do not speak English that well or grew up in a different country. Yep. In Spanish, it's called Hundir la Flota. Oh, cool. Same thing. Yeah, it's nice. uh, to sink the battleship. Oh, that not makes sense. to sink the boats, whatever. But yeah, so it, she explains uh, a little bit how uh, she built all of the things, of course, in Ruby, of course, yep. because Aja. And uh, I think it's, it's pretty cool. It is really cool. Uh, it's worth noting that she steps through all the logic, but she has a deployment for App Engine that is public with an API. So if you want to interact with the API and play Battleship against it, uh, it is sitting there. So you can give it a shot. Yeah, and uh, all of this is, I'm assuming, uh, running on App Engine. Uh, so I'm assuming it's App Engine flexible environment. Yes, I would assume so as well. Yep. Awesome. Well, why don't we go have a chat with our friends Tino and Jordan and find out all the magic things that happen underneath the hood in BigQuery. Sounds good. Let's do that. Cool. So I am very happy to welcome today to the podcast uh, the two gentlemen co-authors of, of a blog that we really, really enjoyed, a blog post uh, by the name of BigQuery Under the Hood. Mm. Uh, so we have today Tino Tereshko. Uh, hi, Tino. How are you doing? Hello. How are you? Uh, doing great. Thanks. Thank you for coming. And we also have Jordan Tigani, a software engineer. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Thanks for uh, having me. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to be talking a lot about uh, BigQuery under the hood. So basically, all of the cool things that make BigQuery possible. Uh, but before we get into that topic, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at Google? Uh, maybe, Tino, you can start. Sure. Uh, up until about a year ago, I was on the BigQuery team working with uh, Jordan and, uh, and the rest of the 
organization, uh, just delivering features and making sure we got the best product possible. Uh, now I am the big data lead for a relatively new organization called Office of the CTO in Google Cloud. Cool. Uh, we actually have an episode that either already came out or will be coming out soon. Yep. We're still not sure <laughs> exactly about what Octo is. Very, very interesting topic. Uh, what about you, Jordan? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, I was one of the first engineers on the, the BigQuery project several years ago now. Uh, I wrote a book about BigQuery, uh, which is getting a little bit out of date. So hopefully this can help uh, keep people up to date with the latest changes. And now I'm the engineering lead of the uh, of the BigQuery product. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, before we get stuck into the under the hoods section, uh, we have done several episodes. I think I'm actually counting about six. I went back and had a look where we discussed uh, BigQuery itself. But for those who people who may not have listened or just want a refresher, what like very high level, what is BigQuery? What's the, like the three minute sort of thing? So BigQuery. BigQuery is, you know, in very simplistic terms is a, serverless, fully managed, whatever buzzword you want to use, high uh, level of automation service that allows you to store uh, vast amounts of data or little amounts of data for analytics and then perform analytics on, uh, on that data in a SQL format. So that's a very, very simple terms. But when you actually start peeling the onion, um, you see that there's a whole lot of stuff behind BigQuery, right? Uh, uh, the compute uh, engine of BigQuery, the thing that executes SQL, is actually Dremel, which is this uh, this internal service that is ubiquitous at Google. And then we have this fantastic storage engine. Uh, it's all tied together through networking. And and the the really the secret glue that nobody ever talks about is our scheduler and the type of magic that's that's possible that to sling resources around from query to query. That's essentially it. But uh, yeah, our, our customers really appreciate the simplicity of the product and, and how easy it is to scale up and down. And uh, I, I think really the biggest thing, again, comes down to the fact that um, it's, it really truly is no ops, right? It's no hassle. You set and forget BigQuery and you just focus on things that are important to you. Yeah, I would just add that you know, uh, one way of thinking of it is a, a cloud-based uh, you know, no ops data warehouse. Um, and it's a lot simpler, simpler to set up uh, and certainly simpler to scale than um, other options. Cool. So you mentioned something about Dremel, which is kind of cool because I know that Dremel is a research paper. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how BigQuery came to be since Dremel? Is it the same thing, just like <laughs> made it available to people outside of Google? Or is there any differences in there? It's sort of an interesting story. And we kind of didn't used to talk about it um, basically because there were some kind of internal politics things ar around it. But essentially, a bunch of us um, in the Seattle office had gotten pulled off of other products that we were working on um, because the site director wanted us to build a, uh, a data marketplace. And, um, and so we, we all got together in the, uh, in the dining room of the original tech lead and tried to figure out how are we going to build this data marketplace. And what we realized was that you wanted more than like, in order to have to be able to, 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 to sell large data sets. And you know, we're Google, we have to deal in large data. Uh, that's sort of what we, uh, what we do, do best, is you wanted more than just sort of a download link. And you also kind of, there's this, uh, this concept that when you have large data sets, that you need to bring the compute to the data rather than the data to the compute. So what we decided was we would build something that would allow you to, um, to bring the compute to the data. So you'd, you'd give us your data, um, the data would sort of sit, uh, you know, in in our cloud, and then you would you would run your computations, and uh, and we we harness the the internal Dremel engine in order to uh, to make this happen. And sort of, you know, six years later, you know, we like, we haven't gotten around to the whole data marketplace thing. We might someday, but but this turned into a quite successful successful product. If I may add to that, I think. You know, it is it is true that BigQuery does sit on top of Dremel in terms of the execution part and scheduling, right? Uh, I think the main difference um, is that we can treat uh, Googlers much worse than we can treat external customers. <laughs> we can we can hmm. opt them into all kinds of crazy, weird dog food um, that we can't do with customers that that you know pay us real money, and and that's kind of been, I think been historically 
uh, the way. For example, the component of Dremel that's really undergone really dramatic change is the actual execution engine. Uh, what's in the paper is no longer really the case these days. Uh, the new engine called Dremel X has been live for about two years in production, was really dog-fooded for a long time internally uh, before the team was comfortable enough to to kind of thrust it on to the rest of the world. Uh, and, and you know, the, the average customer, the average user of BigQuery didn't really know when they switched over to new engine. They just kind of ran a query and all of a sudden it was five times faster. And that's, that's really how they knew they were on the new stuff instead of the old stuff. This sounds really cool, but let's maybe take a step back from some of the, the words like Dremel and stuff that people don't know. What does it look like? So say I've got, I don't know, a terabyte or two of data and I write some SQL how does the magic happen that turns that SQL into computation that potentially spans across multiple computers and does lots of crazy things? Um, can you talk us kind of through that step by step? Sure. It's, it's a little hard to do without, without diagrams and just, uh, just by kind of describing the, uh, the data flow. But one way of, think, you know, of describing the, the Dremel execution engine is there's, there's a query master and there's a bunch of shards. And the query master gets the gets the, the query. It parses it, figures out a query plan, works with the scheduler, schedules the execution of the different parts of the query, and then schedules a whole bunch of whole bunch of these shards to execute that query. Um, one of the nice things about SQL is it's very parallelizable. You know, where clauses and filters can all be completely parallelized. Uh, aggregations can be partially parallelized, uh, and they can be completely parallelized if you employ a, a shuffle. So we have the, a really fast in-memory shuffle that also get, gets into the process. The original Dremel, the Dremel paper was sort of a tree shape where where kind of the filters would happen at the lowest level, the aggregations would sort of bubble up the tree. But this didn't really work for complex queries where you kind of would need to traverse the tree multiple times. And so now what happens is rather than a static tree, the query master will kind of design a, a multi-level tree. So in be, whereas in between we use um, a fast in-memory shuffle or we, uh, in some cases, or we can directly pass the data to the next, um, to the next stage. Um, and this allows queries to be much more flexible and allows us to be flexible when how, how we allocate resources. Let, let me add a little bit of, of sugar from my side. So you, you heard kind of like the engineering point and now maybe the, the, the customer facing point that I like to think about is, Imagine you have this big old, those IBM blue supercomputers that used to be famous in the 80s and the 90s. Imagine if you had terminal access to one of those and you could just, you know, rent one of those for four or five seconds at a time and just, you know, pay per second, essentially. That's kind of what BigQuery gives you, right? BigQuery gives you access to this incredibly vast supercomputer that Google manages for you called Dremel. And you, you push the button and you say, I want to use this thing for a few seconds at a time. That's pretty awesome. Cool. So now I'm wondering, uh, you're saying that there's basically a lot of computers running this, that even though it looks like there's only one big computer, what is going on in this basically massively parallelized query that is sent all around? And, and I guess that how that is actually done, like that, it, that is into the details of the paper and stuff like that. But I'm curious about how, like, how does this actually work? Like, do you need to have like a cluster of computers? Like when Kubernetes, for instance, you create a cluster and then you, you're ready to start running things. Does it work like that or? As Tino mentioned, it's a, it's a multi-tenant system. So it's, it's essentially we we host a number of giant computing clusters and everybody's queries kind of get time sliced onto onto some of these uh, some of these clusters and you know we uh, we strive to give every user 2,000 slots which basically means 2,000 units of individually schedulable action that can they can run in parallel so essentially 2,000 shards per user you might not get that if you if you query in a very um, popular time but um, you should nearly always get get that many that much execution power, uh, and you know, and with, that's going to only be a very small fraction of any of our Dremel trees. Yeah. Uh, and we have a number of Dremel trees that are uh, around the world, mostly in in the U.S. and uh, and in Europe. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that as well. George is talking about just the, the compute component, the query Dremel. Unlike any kind of traditional data warehouse or data lake product, whatever you want to call that. BigQuery does have separation of storage and compute, 
uh, which tends to be a popular term these days. So query is entirely separate from storage, right? So storage is unlimited, it's fully managed, it's really, really inexpensive, but you can leverage uh, analytic capacity on top of that storage in very elastic ways. Well, also what BigQuery has that's really unique is we also separate compute from intermediate state. So a lot of times, you know, any, any typical similar technology keeps state in the nodes that are processing themselves. Uh, BigQuery does that, but BigQuery reserves the right to keep state in what Jordan referred to as this separate in-memory shuffler. This allows us to do all kinds of really interesting things when it comes to efficiency or performance. So uh, now I'm curious about, uh, you're talking about the compute set of things and then the storage set of things. And for the compute side of things, basically what we're doing is we're running, rather than running one really big query, there is thousands of them, like, or I don't know how many, but like many, many of those little jobs running all around that big query tree. Uh, how are those managed? We had an episode on, on Borg. Is this running on Borg? Is this running on Kubernetes? Can you talk about this? Uh, yeah, so they're running on Borg. We also have our own scheduler to sort of deal with when, uh, you know, to redispatch queries that, you know, maybe a part of a query was running on a shard and that shard dies to recognize that and redispatch it elsewhere. Yeah, the, the scheduler also kind of makes you immune from any kind of individual hardware downtime, right? The scheduler knows when something's happening and will try to reparalyze the workload and things like that. And Borg is what's responsible for if, if a machine dies, or sorry, if a, uh, one of those shards dies, uh, it'll restart it and rejoin the, uh, the cluster. The one, uh, one distinction I want to make here before we move on, guys, is you know, uh, uh, any kind of typical similar technology, when you stand up a cluster, quote unquote, you essentially have a process that is really fast, automatically t goes out and puts out sticky notes in a bunch of hardware. It says, this is my hardware right now. Um, and BigQuery does that per job uh, very, very quickly, right? This process that puts sticky notes in the hardware executes in less than a second at massive scale. And then once the query is done, all those stickers are thrown away, right? So it's per job rather than, you know, per getting a cluster going type of thing. That's pretty cool. Cool. And something you definitely alluded to earlier, talking about, so we've been talking about the compute side and sort of on the storage side. Is there anything particularly special about how BigQuery stores the data that enables it to parallelize in a great way or able to affect the performance? Or is it, I mean, I'm just, just going to assume it's not just a hard drive sitting on someone's computer under a desk somewhere. So we use our own uh, proprietary columnar storage format called Capacitor. We looked at a bunch of open column formats, including, including Parquet, which is really, really common in the open source community. Uh, and there wasn't anything that would give us enough control over over how the uh, the queries are executed. For example, in some of the the metadata, it's arranged in a way that that the query engine has to do very little work in order to to satisfy um, a large part of the queries. Um, you know, the hash tables that we built were sort of already pre-built in the, in those headers. And you know, we followed a lot of uh, research papers and sort of some state of the art ideas that people had. And productionized it in uh, in into our our, our storage format. Um, so yeah, each each column is is stored in a separate separate chunk of the file, and you know this allows many databases to use column storage. Now I think we have a, a pretty advanced version of that, that that builds that builds on top of the the sort of the standard column store and, and allows us to a compress better and b read less data. So I'll ask the pertinent question, what does a column store actually give you? Like, what's the benefit there? If you imagine, like, if you, if a record store where you store a full record and then the, the, the first record and the next record, and then you try to compress that, you know, that's not going to compress very well because compression works on eliminating redundancy, and the redundancy that you have across a row is pretty small in general. Um, but usually in a column, there's a lot of redundancy. Maybe you have telephone numbers and the prefix is always the same. Or maybe you have countries and there's only like 10 countries that you deal with. And so these tend to, these tend to, compress, uh, to compress very nicely. The other thing you can do is, is, especially if you're using a distributed file system where you're not worried about like the speed of one spinning disk, is that you can read uh, in a column store, you can read different columns in parallel, because they will end up under under the hood, they will be stored on on different disks. So you get uh, a faster 
uh, effective I.O. throughput by, by reading these multiple columns at the same time. Cool. And I guess that this is also why, from the point of view of a customer, BigQuery doesn't charge you for the columns you do not read. It is because you actually do not read them. So there's no compute cost associated to that. Yes, exactly. So yeah, you save you save on reading the columns you don't care about. And in fact, you know, that was one of the original reasons that the Dremel was created is because there was an engineer who was doing a lot of, you know, map reduces over these log files and these log files had actually hundreds of thousands of columns, but he was u only using a couple of those columns and so he's reading all of this extra data and so he just switched his data to a to a columnar format and wrote a little SQL engine on top of it and you know, that's sort of what what then became Dremel and then what became BigQuery. So I have a story that I heard that I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard that uh, Dremel was created when those map producers that you were mentioning were actually taking almost 24 hours to complete to process 24 hours of logs, which is a bad place to be. Is that true or is it just like a story that someone told me just to, to, to brag a little bit about it? That's absolutely true, and the, the engineer who created it was, you know, basically created it while he was waiting for his map reduces to finish. Yeah. <laughs> Behind every major innovation, there is a very lazy engineer. <laughs> I, just, I love the fact that as well that you're like, yeah, so he just put this thing together. It's like a columnar thing, and then he put a sequel. Like it's just like, yeah, it's fine. He did it in like a couple of afternoons, whatever. And I'm like, yeah. what? <laughs> I think that's just sort of a, like a, uh, an interesting way that, that that stuff often can develop at at Google. Um, you know, not to, you know, flog Google too, too heavily, but, you know, it was, he started it and it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. It was a tool that he wrote, he wrote himself and, uh, it required a lot of, a lot of setup and, you know, he, uh, hired and had, they had an intern and the intern started working on it. And then a couple of the 20% project people started working on it. Um, and now we've got dozens of engineers, uh, and, you know, fortune 500 companies yeah. relying on it. And they, they like to say that, you know, at Google, the the hard problems are easy and the easy problems are hard. So we, we built this <laughs> massive supercomputer engine that just churns through data. But for the longest time, we had people opted into approximate count this thing, for example, right? And that's just kind of like the nature of the inner this organic buildup. Um, and you know, with the, because of Google Cloud, we actually have to care about customers. So now we have <laughs> what what the standard calls for, you know. And yeah, it did. It did lead us to do some things that, in retrospect, you know, we wouldn't have done. You know, Tino mentioned the approx count distinct, where, yeah. you know, internally folks were like, "Well, I'm doing uh, logs analysis, and I don't really care if there's a million and seventeen distinct users or a million and nineteen distinct users. Um, they really all kind of fit into that same bucket, and the algorithm to compute those is." 10,000 times faster to do it approximately. So I'm just going to use yeah. the approximate one. Uh, and there's, you know, there were some syntax things as well that we were like, that made it easier to process your logs. But, uh, you know, once we're trying to, to get people who have been using SQL all their lives to adopt it, they found some frustrations. Luckily, both of those, those things have been fixed. So we've talked so far about uh, compute. We've talked a little bit about storage, about how we store, but not where. Mm. So I'm curious about where do we store all of this? Is this like local disks? Is this in Google Cloud Storage? Uh, we store it in the basement uh, of uh, Building 42. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, I've, I've been there. It's nice. <laughs> uh, no, we, we store it in, uh, in Colossus. Uh, so Colossus is our distributed, distributed file system. Uh, the Google Cloud Storage uh, also uses Colossus. Things at Google tend to be, uh, new innovations tend to be sort of built on top of older innovations. So like the technology stack tends to be very deep. Google Cloud Storage is built on top of Blob Store, which is built on top of Colossus, which uses Bigtable, which uses Colossus. And, you know, BigQuery stores data on, on Colossus. And, you know, Colossus takes care of, of transparent encryption, takes care of encoding. We use an erasure encoding so that the data is stored mm. redundantly. Basically, there's some checksums uh, that are stored elsewhere. So if there are failures that happen on any particular disk in any particular chunk, those can be those can be recovered. And it's actually sort of an elaborate kind of web of of checksums that can be used to recover from uh, lots of lots of failures. And um, so our data is actually stored quite durably within a within a particular cell. And a cell you could think of as a as a building. 
And then the data is replicated to multiple locations. So we re replicate to a couple of different cells, a couple of different buildings within a region. Actually, so the, the GC, the Google yeah. Cloud terms are zones. We replicated a couple of different zones within the, within the region. Uh, and then we also store an off-region copy of, of the data to make sure that in case there's you know, a fire or a hurricane or something, that, that your data is uh, still dur durably stored. Again, with line with how BigQuery works, you don't know that any of that happens. Um, it's just kind of like it's a benefit that you get. And also just, just to make sure that uh, it was a, if, you've, if you, we don't replicate your data out of, out of the country that yeah. you're storing your data in. So mm -hmm. you know, if you say you're storing your data in EU, we don't replicate it out of the EU. Yeah. If you're storing it in the US, we don't replicate it out of the US. Here's one more thing I want to say about that. Because drama is this big thing that has lots of compute uh, sitting around, and sometimes, you know, it's variable capacity demands on this compute. Sometimes it's not at 100%. Um, actually, a lot of times it's not at 100%. So we essentially have excess capacity on the compute side. So what what's sometimes the, the storage engine does is it looks at how the data is stored physically inside of the query and says, well, maybe it can, it can be better, right? Maybe this table is driven by 10 million small files and we can kind of coalesce that number down to 10,000. Or maybe we can, we can do some other improvements here. So, and again, this is also happens without clients knowing about it. You just kind of get potentially better performance. Great. Now that we've discussed uh, two out of the three topics that I wanted to discuss, but we're yeah. almost running out of time. So uh, I wanted to just go over really quick over to make all of this happen for real. You need a good network, I'm going to assume. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the importance of the network in this? Like, are you sending a lot of data around, right? You know, there's some bits in, in here that are, that are proprietary that we don't, that we don't usually, usually talk about. But, you know, I think that one of the real uh, advantages that Google has is the, is the quality of its data center networking. That means you can move data, you know, around anywhere within, within the, the cell uh, extremely quickly, and the, the sort of the total throughput of that is, you know, in the in the petabit range, uh, which is, you know, is pretty pretty massive amount amount of data, and it's also what lets us uh, often compete in performance with in-memory databases because. Uh, you know the kind of performance that we get. People would assume that you can't get with with just regular old spinning disks because we are able to a parallelize it into so many of those disks and b our network is so fast that the overall throughput is extremely high, and it's it's higher than you know you could likely get elsewhere. Awesome. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time a little bit. Well, actually, quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we are going to have to wrap things up. Before we go, um, I'll give you the quick opportunity. Is there anything that we happen to have missed, or maybe there's an event or information that you think people should read? Basically, if it's a last-minute thing you want to make sure is on the podcast, uh, what can go there? Uh, Tino, why don't you go first? Yeah, I, I feel like that blog post we wrote was about a year and a half ago. So it, it, it's probably bears actually expanding on that and talking about other things that BigQuery has, like the data sharing capability and the and the in-memory shuffle a little bit more and, and all the other things. But otherwise, yeah, thanks for having me. Wonderful, Jordan. And um, you know, I'm going to be speaking at the the uh, at scale conference in San Jose at the end of at the end of the month, and I'm going to be talking about the BigQuery storage system and kind of going into details into more detail than we than we shared before about that how that works and why we want to have our own storage system. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, thanks to both of you for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us and tell us all about how BigQuery works. Thank you. Thank you. I love talking about thanks. Big Race, so thanks for, uh, <laughs> thanks for asking. Thanks again for having such a fantastic conversation with us, Tino and Jordan, telling us all about all the things about how BigQuery works. Yeah, really cool. Yeah, I still think it's just magic in unicorns. Yeah, there's there was still so much more to cover, but you know uh, we had to stop it at some point. But super interesting, and let's remember that there was also a blog post that they wrote a long time ago. So yes. if you want more detail and more references, the blog post will be linked from the show notes. Absolutely. Cool. So question of the week. I want like the sentient robot type thing, Jarvis, like Iron Man. I want to be able to talk to my phone and make it do things. Tell me how this is possible. Okay, so um, so I've been <laughs> if you follow me on Twitter, uh, which by the way you should, I've been learning a lot of machine learning lately, 
And uh, so the way to do this is uh, first you need to do some uh, signal processing. Okay. So you need to know like the basics, like uh, Fourier transform and stuff. Okay. Then you're gonna need to develop probably convolutional neural network. Okay. Maybe recurrent. I'm not sure. Okay. To be able to understand uh, to the speech recognition. Uh huh. And then from there, uh, you're going to do the natural language processing, which uh, also uses convolutional neural networks. No, actually more recurrent neural networks than convolutional. Uh, okay. It's not super hard. It's just like basic calculus. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that is that is a way. And actually, if you want to build it by yourself, you can totally do that. There's a different way, which is going to be more high level and that I recommend, which is to simply use like speech API. We have mm-hmm. a, a natural language processing API. Yep. So those work really well, and you can build the whole thing from scratch if you want to. Or even better, you can use something that is designed specifically for this use case, which is API.ai. And API.ai is a super cool thing, because it's a like very simple platform that allows you to use machine learning, even though you have no clue of how machine learning works, Ooh. which is amazing. Because I have no clue. I have a little bit of a clue, okay. but I'm still really lost, so, okay. <laughs> so it really helps. And basically what you do is uh, you define what we call intents, and those intents are matched in between like the text you're receiving and the endpoints on your backend, right? So at the end, what you develop is basically just a, a REST API, mm-hmm. and you're going to get like JSON messages sent there, uh, and you need to respond to those. So it's, for instance, if you want to develop like, I don't know, like a store, you're going to have search and buy and stuff like that, right? And then uh, you just give examples. So those examples, for instance, you say, I would like to buy, I don't know, Pixel XL, right? Oh, yeah. When you say, I want to buy a Pixel XL, what you're going to say is Pixel XL is an entity and I want to buy is the use case. And you just give a bunch of examples, like saying, well, uh, if instead of receiving I want to buy, this is that I would like to get... Well, it's kind of the same thing. So you just give a bunch of examples for the yeah, same interesting. intent. And that's it. It sounds like this would make a really good episode. Yeah, I really believe so. And uh, I'm actually going to be speaking about it during the Cloud Summit that will happen in Sydney, mm-hmm. uh, which I think it's on the day this episode is coming out, yep. which is Wednesday. So that's going to be fun, which might be like Tuesday in Australia or something because you have weird it's dates. It's going to be the same day. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. <laughs> But anyway, it is really cool. And actually, I've been playing with this a little bit. And I open source a little framework for those that would like to do this in Go. Uh, it is super simple. And I built a very straightforward application to do search on Google Flights directly from your phone. Nice. And, and it works. works. Which <laughs> unexpectedly, it works. Yeah. Cool. Well, if anyone from the API.ai team is listening and want to come on the podcast. Yes, yeah. we have. I have so many questions to ask them. So, uh, yeah, if you are in a product manager or an engineer or whoever in API.ai and would like to be on the podcast, there's a formal invitation right now. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> awesome. All right, Frances, before we wrap up, so it sounds like you're going away for a little while? Yes. That I'm sounded go- <laughs> really bad. Uh, I believe you're traveling soon to go on a trip. <laughs> yes, I'm going on a trip. Uh, so I will be going to a bunch of different cloud summits, basically. I be at cloud summit in Sydney, which will happen on the on the 13th. On the same day, there's also a cloud summit in Seattle. I will not be the, in that one because, you know, traveling across the world takes time. So I will not be in Seattle. I'll be in Sydney. And then a couple of weeks later, I'll be at CloudNext Chicago, which is on the 27th of September. And then a couple of weeks later, I will be at Velocity London on the 17th and 18th of October. Then at CloudNext Paris on the 19th of October. And then at DevFest Nantes uh, in Nantes <laughs> on hmm. October 20th. And after that, uh, I don't know, I'll take a break or something because it's going to be very intense. That's fun. Yeah. What about you? Sweet. So what day does this come out? Okay, cool. So I will be at Austin Game Conference on the 25th of September uh, speaking. I will be attending Strange Loop, uh, one of my favorite places in the world, on the 28th of September. In October, I really should book some flights to Australia uh, (laughs) because I will also be there. I'll be there speaking at DevFest Melbourne as well as at Game Connect Asia Pacific and probably pottering around at the very least at Unite Melbourne as well as PAX Australia. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's a busy time of year. Yeah, it's going to be an intense couple of months uh, and then it's going to be even worse. So, (laughs) yay. (laughs) Brand new year. Soon it's going to be 2018. How terrifying is that? Yeah, and uh, episode 100 is coming. Anyway, uh, something will be coming. Yeah, something interesting. (laughs) 
Cool. All right. Well, Francesc, thank you once again for joining me on this wonderful episode today. Thank you, Mark. And thank you all for listening. And we'll see you all next week. 